Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Jason Muavi. I'm a breast medical oncologist at the department of uh, BMO at the uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center. And I'm also one of the editors of Onc Data Advisor. And I have the pleasure today to interview Dr. Carlos Dotti, head of uh, medical affair in the US at uh, AstraZeneca. Welcome, Dr. Dotti. Thank you very much for having me. So this is very exciting. Uh, we heard recently about the FDA approval of uh, uh, Capivacertib uh, with a brand name called TrueCap. Genius name, I really like it. Um, and we're here today to ask you a few questions to understand more about, uh, about the, the study that led to the FDA approval and to understand more about the drug uh, itself. So uh, the first question I have is, um, can you discuss the result of the Capitello 291 trial that led to the FDA approval, uh, especially the progression-free survival outcome and how uh, they can support the efficacy of capivacertib in treating hormone receptor positive HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer that harbor a PIK3CA, AKT1, and P10 alteration? Sure. By the way, just a disclaimer, you are the breast cancer specialist. I am just a hematologist working here. so. Uh, I'll, I'll do my best to not embarrass myself in front of a specialist like yourself. Uh, so capivacitive, as you mentioned, is an inhibitor of the whole pathway, the AKT pathway that includes PI3K, which is a target that has already been addressed by other molecules, but with a novel approach about getting also inhibition of AKT and P10 alterations. Uh, the trial was designed for patients with hormone receptor positive uh, her to negative advanced metastatic breast cancer after one or two lines of endocrine therapy. The whole rationale behind this was to continue the patient with that having drug and drive on endocrine therapy by delaying or even avoiding chemotherapy in second line or beyond. The competitor was the standard of care when this study was started, which was fulvestrin. So it's basically capivacity plus fulvestrin versus fulvestrin placebo. Um, this enrolled more than 700 <laughs> patients. 40% of them were altered in, in, in this pathway. The other 60 either we don't know or were not altered. I'm measuring this because the original design of the trial was for all comers with the power to identify difference between these subpopulations, but it was an, it's an all comers trial. Uh, and the results in the altered population proved to reduce um, the, the, the risk of progression uh, to half. So basically the, the hazard ratio was 0 0.5, reducing the risk of progression in 50% in the patients that have any of these, of these mutations. Toxicity profile, uh, what we expected from preclinical data and better than what we've seen in other inhibitors in, in, this, in the same pathway. So that is a summary of what we have and that led to, to the approval that we received uh, at the end of last year. Yeah, excellent and uh, uh, very exciting for sure. Now, uh, given the significant improvement in the progression-free survival that is observed uh, in this uh, special population with a PIK3CA, AKT1, P10 uh, alteration, how do you envision a capivacertib changing the treatment landscape for patients in this uh, type of breast cancer? So I think uh, if you go back in time, um, the landscape in breast cancer started shaping, started changing when HER2 was introduced, and that brought a completely different approach to patients with that specific mutation. Then there was some advances and so on, but everything changed when CDK4, CDK6 came to market, establishing themselves as the first line of therapy, which is a great molecule, a, a great therapeutic area of, to, to, to have for, for these patients. Unfortunately, some of these patients will develop resistance to this. And the only option that we have is either very toxic regimens. If you have a PI3K mutation, or you can go for an mTOR, which is also very toxic, or you have to go to chemotherapy. And that's why with these results, we are bringing a new opportunity for patients after that progression from CDK4, CDK6, and continue with the endocrine drive by including capivacitive uh, with full Um it's definitely a great op opportunity to bring new therapies to these patients in this setting, but it's also setting the tone of, can we advance this into other areas, potentially earlier lines in, 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 in the hormone receptor positive, but also we have studies ongoing in triple negative, which have similar resistant pathways involving the PI3K AKT pathway, 
uh, that has not been unlocked yet. And that's part of the future for this. Um, so the summary of all this is we're very happy to bring this new opportunity. And I forgot to mention this, but to up to 50% of the patients can have any of these mutations if they are diagnosed properly. So, and then moving into earlier lines can actually bring these better opportunities for even more patients than currently. No, definitely, definitely. Uh, it's very exciting that you're also going to be looking at it in triple negative. And you're right, you're right. This uh, pathway is also altered and is observed in triple negative. Uh, now, I always tell my patient I can have the best drug on earth, but if you're not going to tolerate it and you're not going to take it, it's not going to help you. So my next question to you is, we did observe, yes, it's better tolerated than a lot of other drugs in that target that pathway. However, we see, still see that the most common adverse reaction to capivacertib include diarrhea, some cutaneous reactions like crashes, and changes in blood glucose level, mainly hyperglycemia. How is AstraZeneca planning to support healthcare provider and patient in managing these side effects? So let me go one step back. So when we started developing this molecule, we realized this from the very beginning. And what we saw is that you definitely need a certain therapeutic level to inhibit the whole pathway and get the efficacious part. But continuous inhibition can also lead to more adverse events. And that's why the regime or the schedule how to, to take this drug is actually four days on and three days off. That maximizes the therapeutic uh, effect and minimizing uh, the risk of adverse events. Now, that doesn't mean that they disappear. It minimizes what, and, and it actually makes that the patient stays on treatment longer. Now, it's still very, uh, you see a lot of diarrhea and rush and, and hyperglycemia, not that much hyperglycemia, but definitely rush and diarrhea. But if you see in the trial, the number of patients that actually discontinue the drug of this were very limited. So yes, there is a problem, but it is manageable depending on to, to the efficacy that you're getting. To your specific question about supporting patients and caregivers. So every patient that starts on, on capivacity also receives uh, material to help them identify early on these adverse events, how to manage diarrhea, which is something that it's not that hard to manage, how to make sure that they, they are cognizant of the hyperglycemia that can happen and some early signs so they can contact the physicians if, if necessary, uh, training about how to manage these adverse events, how to contain hydrated. So there's more than just giving the patient the opportunity to get the drug, but also the training of the patients and the caregivers on how to manage this. Because as you mentioned, there's no point in getting a new drug out if the patient cannot benefit in full for, for the effect of the drug. And that includes, make sure that you stay on treatment as, as long as it's effective for you. That's perfect. Anything to help the healthcare provider in their clinic uh, the, from their day to day? So we also do the same materials that we have, we're developing for patients and caregivers. There's also versions for physicians, for nurses, we have a very comprehensive uh, training approach in terms of social media, sorry, social media, omni-channel, so different things that you can actually consult. And we are also going into a lot of congresses with uh, unranded MIGO opportunities, so um, medical education opportunities to, to talk about how to manage this, uh, this new mechanism of action in, in, this, in this new setting. Uh, again, we, we don't want people to get confused about PI3K versus PI3K pathway. And because that could be something that can derail someone to make the choice. I mean, there is options for patients with PI3K. Uh, I'm not arguing on that, but this is a broader inhibition that can help more patients. And we think it's not say it's not okay to compare trials that are not actually uh, meant to be compared, but we always do. And what we've seen at least in, in, in this cross-trial comparison is that safety in, in this pathway because of this four, four days on, three days off, it's looking more promising than continuous inhibition of, of one part of the pathway. Yeah, no, perfect. Because, because you mentioned that I'm going to stay on that topic. So yes, the recommended dose of capivacitive is something we see for the first time. Yeah. So the recommendation is 400 milligram twice a day, four days on, followed by three days off. Yeah. Now you did explain a little bit about the rationale you're giving the break. Um, 
at the break, uh, you know, so you don't have a complete inhibition so you, to minimize side effects, but yet get therapeutic efficacy. But this is going to be challenging for providers and for patients on this alternative scheduling to remember to take them. What is uh, your company trying to do uh, by implementation to assist patient adhering to this uh, treatment regimen? So we provide for, for every patient, we provide a starter kit that includes everything that I just mentioned in terms of uh, awareness and how to uh, identify the adverse events and manage them and how to to manage them with uh, at home, but also reach out to the healthcare provider as, as soon as possible. We also have a, a starting kit that includes a pill reminder on how to use it. So similar to have with other chronic diseases, you have the, the Monday, the Tuesday, the Wednesday, and then of course you have nothing there with this inform information on why this is important and why should you use it in this way. Um, so yeah, there is gonna be a, a learning for all of us, but I think that the trade-off between what you get in terms of, of safety profile is definitely worth because we're, as I mentioned before, we're doubling the results that we have with endocrine therapy alone uh, with a safety profile that not perfect, but completely manageable for, for the type of disease that we are, we are dealing with. Not perfect. How about a blister packet? Yes, that's also uh, in, in, in the plans. So we are working on, on, on how to change the way that actually the drug is presented to patients to make sure that this is as simple as possible. Again, you know this because you've always been working in oncology for a long time. There's, we, there's gonna be improvements in not only in the way that we communicate, we educate, but also that we deliver the drug to patients to make sure that, again, there's only one objective here, which is in order to patients to get the maximum effect of a compound, you need to stay as longer as you can and you can tolerate to, to benefit from that. And that's what we want to do. Excellent, excellent. All right, so uh, my last question to you is, although the, the study that led to the FDA approval, the Capitello 291, showed that the progression-free survival improvement in the overall population, mm -hmm. which was very exciting to everybody, but the FDA approval came specifically to the patient harboring the uh, PIC3CA, AKT1, P10 alterations. What are your reasons, uh, your thoughts on the reasons behind this narrower approval? Uh, and is there, is there a future where you can see a expansion of the label that, uh, that can include maybe all comers, uh, not only the patient with the specific mutation and that pathway? I cannot speak about the agency's point of view, but when, when you see our trial specifically, there is a, there's benefit for all comers. There's more benefit in, in the AKT altered patients than in the all comers. And there's a proportion of patients that we, we were not able to get data on, on, on the status of AKT pathway. Our overall survival data in the New England paper shows the trends towards um, overall survival benefit still immature, so we will continue to look at this data. And depending on those results, we can definitely have uh, more conversations with the agencies. No, that's perfect, that's perfect. All right, well, I wanna thank you so much, Dr. Carlos Dotti, for giving us insights on this exciting FDA approval of Capipercertib. And I'm sure it's gonna help a lot of patients and it's gonna make our life as clinicians much easier, given that we have another excellent tool in our, uh, in, in our uh, treatment landscape. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.